This compendium was funded by State Department funds through the Asia Pacific Partnership on Clean Development and Climate to look at what is the best and the brightest within the United States and share those perspectives with our other countries in the Asia Pacific Partnership, principally India and China. And coincidentally, that is what we're going to be focusing on this final panel, India and China. So uh, uh, we're staying true to form here. And, but what we're going to do is talk about a little bit about what are, we, what are the experts on the panel seeing at the state and local level, at the subnational level, rather, in China and India, and reflect a little bit on, on what they have heard earlier today in terms of the U.S. experiences, and what is the relevancy of the U.S. experiences to what we're finding overseas. So we will start with uh, India uh, portion. We have two individuals. Uh, representing uh, the India perspective. One will be joining us uh, very quickly telephonically, but we'll start with Unmesh Brahmi. And for those of you who were here earlier in the morning, uh, Unmesh is, is indeed a, a Yale a World Fellow. Uh, and, and he and Tim Jarvis have, are co-creators of the new Climate Civics Institute, and we had an hour and a half session this morning, uh, which was very informative, and they're doing some great work first in India and then moving on to Australia. But, uh, but Unmesh uh, is much more than simply a, a world fellow at Yale, although as prestigious as that is. Unmesh presently serves as a senior vice president for corporate sustainability for HSBC in India. At the bank, he has successfully launched a number of businesses aligned corporate sustainability initiatives, including significant bottom of the pyramid work in microfinance, financial literacy, environment, sustainability, climate change, and stakeholder engagement themes, all of which were embedded in, in the Climate Civics Institute. So Unmesh, uh, please share us uh, your insights and perspectives uh, from India. Sure, certainly. Thank you, Griff, for that uh, gracious welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we heard uh, issues today, which uh, all of us have been grappling with historically, as well as currently, between nations, within countries, and some lovely examples of how local action really propels and catalyzes change. I'm going to speak for my assigned five minutes on India and the uh, uh, dramatic confusion we are facing in terms of renewable energy and how uh, uh, collaboration between countries, between uh, energy firms, between energy service uh, companies, uh, utilities can actually uh, create uh, a positive market in the Indian context. So let me quickly outline what is the confusion. Uh, India obviously uh, accepted to a voluntary cut in carbon emissions uh, uh, basis the common and differentiated uh, responsibility platform and uh, is currently voluntarily committed to cut uh, emissions by 25% uh, by 2025 over 2005 levels. Now, while it's nice to say so, uh, it's important to uh, review the situation locally and I'm quite happy to state that within the country, uh, the Prime Minister's office in India has issued uh, almost a year and a half ago the National Action Plan on Climate Change, which is the policy framework document which is guiding the manner in which India would be able to achieve a low carbon inclusive, and that's the key word. Uh, if you don't use the word inclusive and don't practice it, governments will fall because nobody else understands climate change. And 60% of the people uh, who vote for uh, various politicians would not vote for them if issues uh, other than uh, climate change aren't discussed. Uh, so it's an interesting situation wherein we have the National Action Plan on Climate Change, which outlines eight missions uh, to do with various uh, low carbon pathways, to do with solar, to do with geothermal, uh, with tidal energy, uh, knowledge sharing, adaptation uh, for vulnerable communities, so on and so forth. Uh, yet the traction doesn't seem to be developing in terms of creating a market for renewable energy. And I think uh, the problem here is the fact that 50% of the country still does not have access to electricity. Most of our reserves and electricity generation is based on coal. Now, the big confusion and the big question is, can we, in the near future, one year, two years, three, shift the tipping point, if at all there is one, in such a way that everyone gets access to electricity basis of renewable energy? And I think that's a problem that even US is facing. We talked about the coal states today and how to get around that. And that's where I see a scope for collaboration in terms of uh, small projects in um, distributed energy, uh, projects which use uh, biomass as a basis, uh, uh, small projects in solar, 
uh, all of these will have their role to play. Uh, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency is another organization in the country which is pushing the clean energy agenda at a household level as well. And we have now appliances with what we call a five-star energy rating, which means they're more efficient than the rest of the appliances. But I see very few of them on market shelves, which means if I go to buy air conditioner, I may see one brand which talks about our energy rating, but the advertising and marketing by other brands is so very glamorous that you gravitate towards those and forget the five-star rating. So where is the entire slew of manufacturers coming up and accepting uh, these ratings by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency? Uh, there is talk about energy credits, but I think uh, while policy-wise uh, these credits have been approved by the government, uh, renewable energy credits, uh, I'm not too sure how long will it take to put into practice. Uh, having said all of this, uh, there is scope in terms of uh, small projects, which today are showing some uh, futuristic traction in terms of how you manage the energy needs. I know of projects which we are now trying to support through HSBC, which use rice husk to generate local electricity. I know of uh, projects where people have taken plantations and planted uh, uh, biodiesel yielding species to create a biodiesel economy of sorts. Uh, there are various aspects to do with how you provide energy to the bottom of pyramid uh, using renewable technologies, solar uh, being one of them, LED lighting being one of them. And in all of this, uh, there is a distinct movement to use microfinance as a route. And uh, there, I think, which is where the scope really lies, because if you are able to take the excluded population of the country and put them into the energy matrix and try and secure some form of clean energy for them, that's when you will have this grassroots movement growing. So I think while nationally there is confusion, we still seem to be driven towards coal. Locally, these tiny initiatives will indeed make a difference. You know, we heard earlier that Valerie, from Valerie Brown, that state and local officials are very agile. Well, we're going to be agile right now, <laughs> and we're going to shift from, in, <clears throat> shift from India over to China, uh, uh, hopefully to come back to India. But uh, our first speaker on China is Nancy Yao Masbach, who is the first Chinese-American to serve as executive director of the Yale China Association. The Yale China Association is a private nonprofit organization located here on the Yale campus and has worked to build U.S.-China relations on a grassroots level since 1901 through programs in education, health, public service, and the arts. Ms. Mosbach spent several years with Goldman Sachs in Hong Kong and New York, where she worked in the Investment Banking Division, Executive Office, and Global Markets Institute. Ms. Mosbach also spent several years at the Council on Foreign Relations as Managing Director of Corporate Programs, a CFR Hitachi International Affairs Fellow based in Japan, and a research associate in China. Ms. Masbach sits on the national board of the Association of Asian American Yale Alumni. She has deg a degree from Occidental College and an MBA from Yale School of Management. Nancy. Well, in that background, you notice there was nothing specifically on climate change or environmental policies. Uh, so I, what I would like to share thoughts on this morning, and it's, it's really an honor to be here uh, next to people like Unmesh and Barbara Fenimore and Richard Kaufman, people I've read uh, their writings on, on this topic. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to sort of share from sort of the ground up level is what I'm seeing on, from our relationships and partnerships on the ground in China. And I think it's in reaction to some of the discussion that's been happening uh, throughout the day, I think it might be very relevant. Um, Yale China, as Griffin has uh, suggested, uh, and, 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 and we've shared, is, has been in China for over 100 years. We have office in, in Tangsa, Hunan, which I'm not sure how many of you have been to Tangsa, uh, but it's inland, um, and also in Hong Kong. And we've been in Tangsa for 100 years. Uh, that gives an institution that is based in the US a lot of leverage. And what we've noticed on many levels is as an NGO operating in China, uh, there are certain limitations. And in fact, on the NGO level, and I think Barbara probably shared a lot more on that level, but from our perspective is uh, we often leverage our partners in many ways to get things done. Um, and actually right now, there is no official language in China that is comparable to NGOs as we understand them from the US perspective. I lay that all out as a preface because I think that's critical information to absorb and understand as we think about what's happening in the environmental policy space and climate change space on the ground in China. And, and then I'd like to suggest that there is no infrastructure 
There is no infrastructure in China, from my perspective, to really deal with a lot of the issues and, and, and hopes and dreams that we have in this space in the U.S. and as we see it from other parts of the world. Um, and infrastructure is, in terms of uh, my former mentor and supervisor and personal and professional um, friend, Elizabeth Economy, who is one of the foremost leaders in this space, you know, she <coughs> expresses three main challenges with China. One, rule of law two, transparency, and three, official accountability. Those are not foreign concepts, I think, to us when we think about China. But what I'd like to suggest from a very lay, lay viewpoint is that it's not trendy right now. There is nothing trendy about it, and there are no leaders in this space. And when we talk about China, we're often talking about the center, Beijing. We're not talking about even the provincial level, but most of all, we're not talking on the corporate level or on the ground from a representative, individual, one-on-one -on -one level. There is no leadership in this space. Um, and, and as many of us recognize, in China, there are basically three main players. There are SOEs, state-owned enterprises. There are two foreign enterprises, multinational corporations, that have very little power in a space where they are profiting in a way that can be viewed as detrimental to the environment. So very little um, <coughs> leverage point there. And the third most recently recognized group are the domestic private entrepreneurs. These, I will suggest, are the leaders in this space for us to really keep our eyes on. And I'd suggest that an example of this from what we've seen, and this is a company that's based in Changsha, Hunan, Broad, Yuan Da. Has anyone heard of Broad before? That's wonderful that you haven't. Today is the day you're going to learn about them. Broad is a private end company. Its main, it has three business lines. One is non-electric air conditioning, air cooling systems. The second is air purifiers. And the third is sustainable buildings. They're a private company based in Changsha. They have an emphasis-like campus in Changsha. I've been, had the privilege of staying overnight there and, and benefiting from all of their uh, different uh, products, um, their air purifiers, prefabricated buildings, a lot of these different types of products that they sell. About, worth about $300 million, I'd suspect. Um, so a very a leader in this space. Chairman Zhang Yue, the head of the company, is a leader um, in this space in every respect on the China front. He's a leader not only because he's creating products that actually contribute and make the world cleaner and better, but two, he's trying to be a global citizen. And he's doing that against the tide, against the tide in China for a number of reasons. He's very proud of the taxes he pays to the government, so he gets a lot of respect from Beijing. Two, he refuses any bribes at all, and this is part of his mantra. And, and three, he, he's very dogmatic about sharing how one should be a global citizen. And he's printed these little books that basically say, you should have one child, not because the government tells you to, but because one child will save 250 trees. So he, he's done that sort of analysis, and he's really been a leader in that space. Um, he's also been awarded, the glo he's a global partner for the World Expo in China. And because of all this work in the leadership space, he's the exclusive supplier of the central air conditioning, the ventilation, and the air purification products for the Shanghai Expo. I recommend that when you all go there between May and October of this year, that you will recognize and look out for Broad and really see um, that leadership. I'm excited about what China can do, but only as much as we can see corporate leaders, private entrepreneurs take the lead. Otherwise, the impact will be so far, we will all be dead and buried by the time we see that sort of uptick. So in, in that sense, I think that we, um, Chinese are very practical in the sense there's no infrastructure, there's no cool moms, there aren't any cool moms out there in China right now. And we really need to encourage that sort of leadership from many different levels. But I think the most successful route is definitely on the ground from the corporate perspective and domestic enterprises. And so the only final point is many of you may be familiar if you follow China. Fred Hu is the chief economist um, at Goldman Sachs. He's also a Hunan native. And he said, if it can happen in Hunan, which is where Broad is based, it can happen anywhere in China. Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou do not represent China. Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, very, uh, nice, nice touch, uh, nice perspective. Uh, we are told that uh, our, our, our link with India is not going to work, so uh, we'll continue on uh, with the rest of the China presentation. Umesh, you are the sole Indian <laughs> representative here. The burden is on you. Absolutely. No but the burden you can uh, fill nicely. Our next speaker is Barbara Finnamore, who is the founder and director of the China program at the Natu Natural Resources Defense Council and RDC, one of the world's most effective environmental organizations. NRDC was the first international environmental group 
to establish a clean energy program in China. Ms. Finnamore now leads NRDC's 30-member China team work, working out of our Beijing and U.S. offices on climate change, energy efficiency, renewable energy, responsible sourcing, sustainable cities, and environmental governance. I personally had, a, had, a, had a, met uh, Barbara and some of her team in Beijing several years ago, had a delightful lunch, and I learned, learned so much about uh, the workings in China. NRDC works with China to build capacity and develop innovative laws, policies, technologies, and market mechanisms to accelerate its transition to a clean, low-carbon economy. And Mayor Nichols, uh, you have a, a fellow Harvard grad here. She's um, uh, Barbara has a, a degree from Harvard Law School, if that's okay. Um, Barbara, it's all yours. This doesn't seem to turn on. No, it's just for. Uh, Oh. It's it's for it's 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 it's, it's a show. gimmick. It's a gimmick. <laughs> it's a prop. It's a visual prop, right? Yeah, official prop. Oh, wonderful. You have to speak into it. Oh, oh, I get it. Okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you, Griff, and it's a pleasure and a delight for me to be here with all of you today to talk about subnational efforts in China because that's been a fascination of mine for nearly 20 years. Uh, since my first experience in China was to work with about 70 different government agencies to develop China's blueprint for sustainable development for the 21st century, uh, which was very, very advanced. It was the first one prepared throughout the world after the Rio conference. Uh, but China recognized even then that it was going to depend upon the provinces to carry it out. And there was a lot of interest at that time, even at the local level in the cities, in, in helping to uh, carry out the uh, ambitious targets at that time, this is 20 years ago, in their uh, subnational, provincial, and local plans. Um, when I first started for NRDC, started our NRDC program about 15 years, uh, we quickly learned that it was, we were gonna get nowhere at the central government level in promoting energy efficiency. At that point, all they cared about was economic development and actually electrification of the country because so much of the country just didn't have access. So that was their main focus and we would talk about energy efficiency and um, system benefit charge and things like that. Got absolutely nowhere. So we learned very quickly, the only way we were going to make a difference is to go to find a good province and try to test out pro uh, these policies that we saw working so well in the United States. And that's actually been our focus all these years in China is to take best practices from uh, in, in the U.S. actually on efficiency of renewables, it has been primarily the state level and the city level, things that we heard about earlier today. Take those best practices, bring them to China, and help them figure out where, what parts of it might make sense, how to adapt it for use um, in China's conditions. And so we moved to Jiangsu province, which interestingly enough is a sister province from, with California and has always seen itself as the California of China. It shares a lot of characteristics. It's very well uh, developed uh, economically um, and, um, and they wanted to emulate our, our work there. So, um, but, but before I go further, I, I do have to say the interplay is uh, different in China than it is in the U.S. because it's a unitary government. So all of the provinces, have every agency at the provincial level is, you know, tied, um, at least through a dotted line way, to the um, central government agency. They're like many central governments in every province. And the officials um, of the provincial governors, for example, uh, report to the central government. And that's a very important factor I'll talk about in a minute. But it also, I mean, it has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one disadvantage is that in many cases, uh, provinces do not have the kind of freedom and uh, ability to, to, to experiment with new policies that they do in this country. They have to seek approval in certain ways and for certain things. So it hampers their ability for the most, the most active provinces to develop those kind of, 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 uh, of uh, advanced policies and mechanisms that we've been trying to promote. On the other hand, when they do figure out a way to get around these constraints and come up with pilots that work, it's much easier for them to be disseminated to the national level and become national policy. So that's been our, uh, uh, that's been our strategy and it's worked. It's worked in Jiangsu uh, particularly uh, uh, for energy efficiency. We got, we developed the first energy efficiency uh, 
a potential study in China in Jiangsu showed enormous potential, much bigger than you're going to find anywhere in the U.S. Jiangsu couldn't believe the numbers, but when they looked him over, spent a year reviewing them, they said, goodness, uh, we want to do something. We want to capture this energy efficiency potential. They found a way to use revenues from their electricity system and develop the first provincial level demand side management program. And so that eventually was cited by the premier of China as a model for the rest of China. And the central government is about to develop and uh, issue national regulations uh, that are going to allow utilities in every province to recover the costs of helping their uh, customers save energy. So this is a major breakthrough I'm delighted about. And now we're in the process of working with four other major provinces and cities who want to do the same thing. Um, and uh, Hebei is another example. They, uh, they, had, uh, their, they were the actual first ones to develop a system benefit charge for DSM, demand side management, in their province. That only provides a certain amount of funding for energy efficiency. So now they're developing and exploring new financing mechanisms for energy efficiency. One is called the Super ESCO that will bring together a lot, that kind of act as general contractor for a lot of spe specific ESCOs. Uh, in, in, in meeting customers' needs for retrofits in industrial building sectors. Uh, another is um, uh, public-private partnerships for, for financing of energy efficiency. So we're working very closely with them. Um, I want to say, however, that just like in the U.S., not every province is like Jiangsu. Uh, some are very progressive and others lag behind. So here's another benefit, I think, of the way that China's political system is set up, because now the government has caught on to the value of energy efficiency uh, and climate protection. It has set national targets, I'm sure you've all heard about. One is this 20 percent reduction in energy intensity between 20, 2005 and 2010. Well, how do they meet that, or how are they trying to meet it, because they haven't yet? Um, and that is they've allocated the target to every province. And this is the, the key point. Uh, they have adjusted the job performance rating system of every provincial governor and the head of all the top 1,000 energy using enterprises to reflect how well they have achieved their portion of the national target. I just wonder what the state officials in this country would feel if they were also rated by the president on how well they are achieving the national goals, such as they are, or whether we come up with them. But that is the reality in China. And I have never seen any mechanism be so successful um, than this one in gathering the attention of these provincial officials. Uh, they're still a ways away. They have till the end of this year to meet it. But I think between, you know, all the incentive policies that China set up, which they're taking advantage of, and this very important job performance rating system, uh, they're going to come as close as they can to meet this ambitious target. Um, on renewable energy, a lot of the action has been at the national level, actually top down. Uh, renewable energy law, re golden sun, golden roof, major incentive programs, feed in tariffs for wind, um, and targets for wind, for solar. Uh, for biomass by 2020, very ambitious ones. They keep having to revise upwards and major investment. Last year, China, for the first time, was the number one investor in clean energy in the world. Its investments were about double those of the U.S. And even though installed wind capacity in China is still behind the U.S., they're growing so fast they're probably going to catch up this year or next. However, there's still room, I see, for action on the uh, local level, in, in this case in particular, on the city level, particularly in things, well, uh, provinces are vying for these major uh, wind and solar projects. Uh, there's a, a city in uh, Inner Mongolia, Ordos, which is really the factory for just about every kind of renewable energy development going on in the world. You know, and I spoke last week to a fellow, um, Gary Dirks, who was the head of BP China for about 20, 25 years. He said, you want to know the future of renewable energy in the world? Go to Ordos. Uh, one of the things they're doing is building the world's largest solar power plant there, uh, two gigawatts. It's going to you know, be bigger than the island of Manhattan when it's fully uh, completed. And that happens to be a project by a U.S. company. I must give it a plug there. First Solar won that contract because it has the best technology. 
However, um, solar feed-in tariff, there still is no national one. I think China's a little bit nervous about that, but uh, Jiangsu has instituted the, the first solar energy feed-in tariff to try to level the playing field with the still very cheap cost of coal-fired power plants. So that's it. And I think the biggest action on the renewable side is solar water heaters. China leads the world in this and uh, has two-thirds of the world market. And what we're seeing now is cities vying to be called China's solar city. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, and they have every kind of uh, 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 incentives from financial incentives to actually regulations requiring government buildings to install the solar thermal uh, or even, um, you know, integrated building systems. But the, the, the biggest kick I got was a couple of weeks ago, went to this town called Dujo. It's about two hours on a high-speed train, of which we don't even have to start talking about how many there are in China. Two, two hours on by train from Beijing. It's an entire solar city. It's built by a company, a company that is the largest solar thermal manufacturer in the world. And they wanted to promote their project, so they built a whole city just of buildings with these solar thermal products. And met, by the way, every other type of solar uh, technology that's in existence today to demonstrate it. So that kind of leadership is, I agree, is extremely important. We're seeing it in China. So I would say in addition to the provincial level, to the city level, we're seeing it at the corporate level, especially in in renewable energy. So I'm pretty excited about this initiative. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Now our final speaker today, uh, so, so Richard, you can serve as the exclamation point on, on a long line of good speakers. Richard Kaufman is the Chief Executive Officer of Good Energies, one of the largest independent investors in renewable energy. Previously, Richard was a managing director of Goldman Sachs, and he worked in numerous leadership positions with Morgan Stanley. Richard also has been a lecturer in finance and financial accounting at the Yale School of Management and a teaching fellow in foreign policy at Yale College. Uh, Richard is on the board of... Okay, okay. let's... Oh, let's, okay, let's <laughs> yeah, I guess we want to yeah. go home tonight. Yeah, okay. Uh, Richard, tell us about uh, renewable energy investment. Okay, so why don't, why don't I talk... Uh, about uh, solar in China. Uh, we uh, are a major investor in one of the Chinese uh, solar manufacturers. Uh, so we do a lot of other things other than China, but since this panel is on China, that's what I'm going to talk about. And so uh, it's a sort of interesting contrast since we're, we've been talking about things in, in the United States and now talking about, uh, about China. Uh, I'd say that uh, neither place has got things quite right in terms of development of, of, uh, of, of markets and manufacturing. So let's talk about China first. Uh, China has some very substantial assets. And so uh, when we talk about China and solar, we're really talking about Chinese manufacturing for export. So the, the number of about investment this is the, there have been substantial investments made, uh, no question about that, but these are uh, investments, at least for the moment, primarily dedicated for export. Uh, what, uh, what we've seen is it's certainly amply supported by, uh, by uh, local, uh, local governments, uh, really down to the city level, so uh, the company that uh, I know the mayors of, and the vice mayors of the uh, of of the of the company in the city in where the company is located because they're very concerned about employment. They will do anything that uh, they can to help out. So when this company needs a new plant, we can get it approved in a week. And so you can imagine, in comparison to the United States, how difficult it is to get uh, uh, local that kind of uh, local support. Local banks. Now we know what's going on with the financial side of the United States. The solar industry is uh, below investment grade, so uh, the uh, Chinese manufacturers are amply being provided with ample liquidity from from local banks. 
and that's a huge asset. And increasingly, what we're seeing is finance being made available for financing of projects, again, international projects, as the manufacturers are for export. And that's a huge, huge benefit because it's very hard to get project financing for solar projects uh, anywhere in the world, debt, debt financing. Um, so the other assets that, uh, that uh, China has, uh, I guess I've already talked about it broadly, is, is you know, there are very few NIMBY issues. I already sort of touched on that, but you even see that on, some, on, the, on the domestic projects that relate to, to transmissions. Uh, we talked about the feed-in tariff. You know, we don't have feed-in tariffs in the United States. We do have feed-in tariffs uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. That's made a huge benefit to the development of, of uh, renewable energy deployment generally. And so that's a real positive, the fact that we see that now in China. But we need to recognize that in solar, this is a really tiny, tiny, tiny part of the market. It's really being used, I think, as a kind of backup to support the domestic, uh, to, to, to support the manufacturing, because it's really a manufacturing uh, 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 for export. So this, this uh, uh, feed-in feed -in tariff for the domestic market is really s to support the manufacturers because they're still oversupply. And this actually, the program, um, uh, I think, is, is really being used, this domestic uh, solar program is really being used to help the manufacturers get rid of uh, second and third quality uh, 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 production. So uh, there's, not, there's not, much, um, not much margin. Uh, the prices are low, but it's a way of, of helping uh, the economists would get you know, the idea that this helps uh, uh, contribution uh, uh, to, to, to overhead. Um, so you know, kind of, so I talked about the sort of advantages. What are the issues that I see? Well, one issue that I see is that, uh, and Nancy talked about entrepreneurs. Uh, on the manufacturing side, we have, uh, if you forgive the pun, you know, let a thousand f uh, flowers blossom. That's what's happening with, 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 with entrepreneurs. These are entrepreneurs and solar that, that want to be in manufacturing. And China is a place for manufacturing. So you have, it, it's not very hard to get into the solar manufacturing business. The equipment is, is, is widely available. Uh, 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 so if you have some capital, you can get into the business. And so that certainly happened. And so there are, um, I don't even know the number of manufacturers, but there are lots of them trying to get into the solar, uh, solar module manufacturing business. And so um, I think that the, the problem with that, I think, uh, it's probably good for consumers because it means the prices have continued to come down. Uh, but it's a real problem in terms of creating profitability for the industry. So I think when I look at it globally, you know, I, it's, it's not really good for the solar industry because if you can't generate re appropriate returns on capital, you know, you're not going to, you know, well, I don't need to finish the sentence. So that, there's a problem. And at some point, it's going to come to tears. And one of the problems with this patchwork between the national and uh, provincial and state authorities is that there's, Nobody, there's no encouragement to, to much encouragement to, to allow for industry consolidation. And so when you have a bunch of entrepreneurs that all think that they're, you know, really important and many of them have other businesses that they can continue to subs use to subsidize this, this the, their, their solar business, you know, it, it really creates a lot of cultural problems towards uh, industry consolidation. No entrepreneur is going to blink. Uh, and sell to somebody else's on somebody to sell sell to somebody else or work for somebody else, as you can imagine. So that's a problem. Another problem uh, is that what we've seen elsewhere in the world is you know we talk about manufacturing, but really if you want to have renewable energy, you need it to be deployed, right? It's not just about manufacturing; it needs to be deployed somewhere. So we talk about solar. You're talking about building solar uh, parks. Well, what we've seen elsewhere in the world is, yes, utilities are able to do that, but where it works particularly well uh, in the world is when you have entrepreneurs that are going around developing projects. Uh, because, you know, if, if you want it in local places and uh, the benefit of solar is it's a distributed solution, you know, it works best when you can go find places where you can secure development rights and work with local communities. Uh, 
And so we don't, that, that infrastructure really doesn't yet exist in, in, in China. It doesn't exist because uh, uh, we don't really have enough of a feed-in tariff, and we don't, there's no project finance, per se, that exists in China. That capability doesn't really exist. And so that is a real problem. It's inhibiting the development of entrepreneurs. Not, we don't need more entrepreneurs in China making things, making more production. We need more entrepreneurs deploying it in the field. Uh, and so uh, the other point I'd make in terms of finance is the short-term finance uh, is, is, a, is a real problem. I talked about short-term finance, that the local banks are providing short-term financing. If you're in the manufacturing business and you have relatively long-dated assets, Finance 101 is you don't finance, you know, kind of long-dated assets with short-term debt. And that's what goes on now in China. And that is a problem because if there's a problem in the financial s sector in China and those loans get, those short-term short -term loans aren't renewed, the industry, the, those, those companies will go bankrupt. So the, there's, there's, there is a there's an, uh, mismatch in funding. So uh, maybe this last point here. I mean, just I said at the beginning that we don't have the United States and China don't have things quite right. So in the United States, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. One other thing about project finance because the the, the benefit it's about innovation because the 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 one of the things that is good about having a ma a critical mass of manufacturing is that when you have a critical mass of manufacturing and scale, that's when you're going to get innovation. Uh, and that's one of the things we haven't figured out quite right in the United States. Uh, there's, a, there's a small but important little wrinkle when I talk about project finance that's relevant for innovation. And that is, if, is that uh, the way things work is if you can get project financing, say in Europe or in the United States, you can, there's a little bucket that's permitted for innovative technology. For, for, another, for, for technology that's not standard technology. And that's the way that you can test uh, technology, so it eventually, new technology, so it eventually can get uh, project financing. And one of the challenging challenges in renewable energy is what is bankable, what, what you can get project finance for. And the only way you can get project financing for, for something <coughs> is after you've it's been in the field for a long time. So if you hope to get innovation, you have to have project financing and ha allow for this bucket for, uh, for this new technology. So just, just, just in conclusion, I think, I think in the United States we've done a poor job of creating uh, uh, critical mass in manufacturing uh, because we just have less of a focus in manufacturing, unfortunately, in the United States. So China's done a good job in being able to establish a critical mass of manufacturing. It's for export. Of course, in the United States, it should have been for domestic market, but that's really the problem in the United States is we haven't developed a domestic market for solar of any, of any consequence. Um, we've done a really good job in the United States uh, with project finance. We know really we have, we have a lot of capability of project finance. China doesn't have that. Uh, China's, uh, we have a weak banking sector in terms of lending. China, we've talked about it. Uh, we have obviously NIMBY issues in the United States. China doesn't. We don't have feed-in tariffs in, in, the United, in the United States. China, China does. We use tax, tax benefits. And frankly, and this will be my final point, you know, uh, there's both countries in, a, in their own way need to provide a capital market solution for long-term financing of projects. So in China, there's no domestic bond market of any consequence. And that's something that's really, really important to develop for China, not just generally. Uh, and, so, uh, and so one way to develop that uh, domestic bond market might be to use the bond market to develop uh, funding for long-term uh, long-term project finance for, for renewable projects. Um, we don't have such a, a – we do have a very good debt market in the United States, but we don't actually – every project, though, in the United States is bespoke. We don't have a, a general standards for, uh, for capital, a capital market solution for project financing. So ironically, for different reasons, both countries – this is a frontier that both countries could try to work on and maybe solve. Well, thank you very much, Richard. I, I particularly like the comparisons and contrasts of China and the U.S., what, what, who's doing what uh, perhaps better or, or not as well as the other. The very, very insightful perspectives. We have a few minutes for 
questions for this distinguished panel, and then we'll wrap up uh, the day's proceedings. Questions from the back. My name is Srinath. Uh, I'm a first year Master of Environmental Management student at the School of Forestry. And my question is uh, to Mr. Unmesh. Uh, recently, I've been reading about uh, India's plans to develop uh, 20 gigawatts power uh, from solar alone. And uh, hearing Barbara speak about uh, you know, China's progress already, and considering the fact that India needs to spend at least $20 billion to you know, ramp up power up to you know, by 2022, I guess. So um, do you see, what kind of prospects do you see here? And uh, do you actually see a lot of people coming forth with uh, you know, project finance and money, capital, sure. and stuff like that? A good question. In fact, uh, most of the answers uh, were in uh, Richard's fantastic uh, presentation on finance as to what plagues uh, the financial <coughs> markets and their uh, propensity to fund uh, renewable energy, uh, including solar. When I've been trying to work with U.S. commercial service uh, back home in India in trying to get U.S. manufacturers access to uh, financial institutions in trying to figure out whether a route is possible. But I think typically what is happening is it's fine if you are a solar manufacturing entity because you have a history of a balance sheet. But if you're a deployment uh, entity, you don't have either. So the the appetite for bankers to be able to evaluate something which is new is not there. I'll give a quick example. Uh, through HSBC, we purposefully signed a mission-driven MOU, uh, a Memorandum of Understanding with the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. Uh, lo and behold, to do what? To train our credit risk management people in how to assess uh, renewable energy projects, in how to figure out a way to even learn what is a ESCO or what is a super ESCO. Uh, how to get into performance contracting and future cash flow projections basis which a uh, financial model could be created now. So this is work in progress. Uh, there is uh, lots to be done, and you can only do it by building capacity of the sector. Of course, needless to say, the sector is right now, even in the country, the financial sector, it's just about getting over the crisis, and it's still actually mentally chasing money which is out there in the market instead of doing something new. So I think these are the various scenarios. The government is doing all that it can. But interestingly enough, even the subsidies being offered, I mean, I have been speaking to the Ministry of Renewable Energy in India. Uh, their subsidy is there. I mean, but the point is you have to lend at 1% interest rate. If your cost of funds are 9% or 8%, you can't lend at 1%. Uh, so then what do you do? Uh, where do you really create the incentivization for the banks? And in today's situation, you can't really even keep a pot of money inside a bank saying, listen, it doesn't matter. I'll put this at 1%. Because there are somebody else, uh, other, other players in the market, who other customers who may want to take some finance from you at 10 11 14%. So you can't take that differential loss, at least in this uh, uh, turbulent state. But uh, the government is doing all it can in terms of uh, giving uh, power purchase agreements. Um, uh, two, uh, uh, you know, entities who are willing to set up uh, uh, solar power, including promising, for example, in the state of Rajasthan, grid connectivity, uh, so that to take the solar power to the last mile. Uh, these are experiments as of now. It will be only time which will tell us whether they, they will really bear some fruits. But the intention is there. I don't see the market developing immediately. I will give it at least three to five years. Yeah. Thank you, Amrish. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you all for being here. My name is Wes Morgan. I'm a second year student at the School of Management. Uh, my question is mostly for Mr. Kaufman, but to some extent to all of you. Um, you've brought up, brought up the issue of there's kind of different areas within the entire system. There's the, the project finance, there's the entrepreneurs who are doing production, but also those who are actually deploying. There's several different pieces of this. How, how do you see kind of the project management, the entrepreneurship of rolling things out beyond just the financing and beyond just the manufacturing, but how do you see that uh, coming down the pipeline from students such as ourselves in the School of Management, both in the United States and abroad? I'll take part of it, and I certainly uh, will turn it over to others. I mean, I think that the, um, I, there's true, I mean, I'm sure on campus we know there's tremendous interest in, in renewables, right? So. So I, I have lots of uh, uh, belief, and, and, and uh, I don't think that there's a constraining factor. The con in terms of binding constraints, I don't think there are binding constraints in terms of entrepreneurial activity. That's not at, at all the problem I see. 
uh, I see that the, that the problem that we have, for example, in the United States is that uh, we, we don't have the uh, market signals or the regulatory um, uh, or, or regulations right. Uh, so the consequence of that is that we have lots of entrepreneurs that are trying to set things up, but then they can't get very far. And so we've got, um, and, and my favorite thing is kind of, uh, when I talk about innovation, is that we have the innovation deployment horse and cart backwards. Because in the United States, we think that the, there's a problem. The reason we don't have more renewable energy in the United States is because we've got a technology problem. Well, I don't think we have a technology problem. We don't have an entrepreneurial problem. Uh, not at all. I think we have some, we have, we have in, in, uh, inhibitions to deployment, to market development, because of bad market signals and because of bad regulation. And so if we can start, and we have an example in Western Europe where because of feed-in tariffs I talked about before, uh, and, uh, and markets developed, and through the development of market and scale, then costs began to decline, and then you had the ability to get more and more innovation that resulted from having established a market. So that's the problem I see in the United <coughs> States, and, you know, and, and I think to a degree, and I, I'm not expert in China as much as others on the panel, I, but you, get a, you, get, you certainly get a flavor that, there, that the problem is not entrepreneurial capability in China either. Uh, we know that there's some fantastic entrepreneurs in China, but if you don't get some of this, uh, um, what, what sounds very prosaic, but if you don't get some of the market structures right, uh, you're just going to block the entrepreneurial activity or wind up having entrepreneurs wind up doing things or staying in areas uh, where they're going to wind up actually not being that successful. And we're seeing that, I think, in, in the entrepreneurs, for example, in the solar sector. They're killing themselves uh, 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 trying to compete in solar manufacturing when there might be other areas where they could, could be more profitable. I can just add. Uh, I, I think you perhaps were focusing on project management. Uh, is that what you're Correct. working on? And, and I would just say, uh, I agree with you completely on the entrepreneurial side, but on the project management side, I would say there's always room uh, for people with expertise in project management. I think that is an area where China is going to welcome uh, the kind of Western techniques and, and expertise that'll help them do a better job in the project management. So, so to answer with the question you didn't ask, yes, there's always room for someone like you in China. And uh, I'll just give you one example. Um, uh, I've been helping to uh, uh, bring a, a, a class uh, from Stanford. It's a China energy class that's taught every two years. And the teacher actually brings the entire class to China for their spring break. We just had them in China last month. Uh, but the class uh, uh, last time, two years ago, included a woman who was uh, you know, uh, interested in renewable energy in China. And after she graduated, um, w one of the places we visited on the two-week tour was a, a Goldwind, which is now one of the largest uh, wind energy manufacturers in China. She called them up. And they said, come and work with us in uh, Xinjiang province, way out in western China near Tibet. So she went out there for several years. And, and is, was one of their leading lights. And now she's working for a consulting firm uh, uh, on wind in, uh, in Beijing. So I just wanted to say that. And, and can I just mention one more trend, I think, on the subnational level to watch that I forgot to mention? And, and that is, as you probably all know, China's now developed and announced a climate carbon intensity target uh, between now and 2020. And that's going to be included in the 12th five-year plan that will be approved next year in the 13th five-year plan. Again, it will be allocated to the provinces uh, and put in that job target responsibility system. But we're already seeing a tremendous interest on the part of provinces and cities to develop what's called low-carbon development zones or low-carbon development plans. It's like in China years ago what sparked the development of the private sector market-based economy was special economic zones where they had certain tax breaks just, you know, for private enterprises. But, but anyway, so we've been uh, besieged with requests from different provinces, from, from different cities to help them develop low-carbon development plans. And what I like about this is that it's, 
It integrates efficiency. It integrates renewables, also transportation, city planning, and, uh, and all the elements of, uh, of low carbon development. So keep, that, keep a watch on that. Thank you. We'll do that. Too Absolutely. It's an interesting question, how does a social entrepreneur in this sector succeed? Uh, from the Indian context, we do have plenty of angel investors who are trying to offer a low cost finance uh, in terms of uh, such activities. And uh, uh, the kind of solution which I'm piloting back home is how to make uh, financial institutions <coughs> bite the bullet in terms of trying to really invest in uh, entrepreneurial activities at the bottom of the pyramid on energy. And uh, one route which I could find at a very small level is to use your philanthropic budget to give uh, low cost debt and see how the entire entrepreneurial sector is able to function. Is it able to absorb that debt? Can it go from proof of concept to a demonstration plot? And then can you use that uh, entire demonstration piece to be able to then attract more funding? I mean, I mean you help uh, go through the grant approach towards the low cost debt to be able to create some balance sheet and some sales quotient to be able to then say, fine, we are now ready for regular funding. <coughs> so that helps sometimes. Okay, it is 5.30 on a Friday afternoon. That is absolutely gorgeous outside. And, and I have to compliment each and every, got to compliment each and every one of you. You're still here. This is astounding. Uh, first of all, I want to thank this distinguished panel. Join me in thanking them.